Good evening, I'm Don Godish and welcome to South Carolina ETV and ETV Radio's coverage of Governor Nikki Ronhawa Haley's 2014 State of the State Address. This marks the fourth occasion for Governor Haley to deliver to State of State as she's entering the final year of her first term in office as governor. The stage is set as in 2009 when she first delivered her State of State Address, the economic times were quite different as both the nation and the state were in a deep economic recession. Now, some four years later, both the state and the country have enjoyed more robust economic times and the legislature enjoys a surplus of funds to appropriate. The governor is expected to deliver a speech that includes many key legislative agenda items for her in the 2014 legislative session. Those include educational reforms, continued efforts on job creation, and tax reforms. The State House Chamber is full of House members, their colleagues from the Senate, the, the full judiciary, constitutional officers, invited guests, dignitaries, and the general public, as we and all those others await the governor's 2014 State of the State Address. Jacket. He's probably here. Tom Corbin has got on all the Teal blue shirt, a great, a great. All right, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the Joint Assembly and our honored guest, I'm proud to present to you the Honorable Nikki Haley, the Governor of South Carolina. Governor. Speaker, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the General Assembly, constitutional officers, and my fellow South Carolinians, let us start tonight, as we have rightfully done in the past, by honoring those heroes we lost over the last year. It is my sincere prayer that a year will come that there are no names for us to read. So now please join me as we pay tribute to those who gave the last full measure of devotion in the service of our state and country. Specialist Ember M. Alt, Beach Island. Deputy Sheriff Joseph C. Antoine, Lake City. Private First Class Barrett L. Austin, Easley. Volunteer Firefighter 
Michael L. Bros, Bridgeville. Deputy First Class, Timothy E. Causey, Nichols. Deputy Sheriff, Robert L. Evans, Lugoff. Assistant Chief, Robert C. Hardy, Loris. First Sergeant, Inez Renee Odom Baker, U.S. Army Retired, Casey. Chief Warrant Officer, Curtis Skinny Reagan, Somerville. On behalf of all South Carolinians, to their families, no, we will never forget. I'm blessed to have the support of an amazing family, both sets of parents, my brothers, and my sister. But more than anything, I am the proud mom of two amazing kids who keep me grounded. To them, I am just mom, and nothing makes me happier. Please help me welcome Naylan, who is now 12 and my star basketball player, and Rena, who is now 15 and my happy cheerleader. I am touched, honored, and so fortunate to be a military spouse. Michael's deployment to Afghanistan played out a little more publicly than we would have wished. It was trying for the kids. Many told me the year would go by fast. Well, it didn't. But we are thrilled and I'm a happy girl to be able to say I have my soldier home. Please help me welcome back the coolest first man, Michael Haley. One of the best things about giving this speech each January is it gives me the opportunity to celebrate some of the people and deeds that have made us all smile. Last year, we had one in particular that showed the country her exceptional grace and talent. Candace Glover wowed the nation when she won American Idol. And when I met her, she wowed me. Candace is an inspiration, a shining example of what it means to never give up. She was forced to audition three times before she ever made it to the live show. But once she got her chance, she grabbed it with both hands and never let go. Candace, the daughter of John and Carol Glover, is the oldest of seven children and a graduate of Beaufort High School. John and Carol, you are amazing parents and raised an exceptional daughter, a wonderful young woman who portrays South Carolina in the best possible light. Please help me congratulate, thank, and celebrate our very own American Idol, Candace Glover. You have made your home state incredibly proud. I can't go any further without talking about what happened in this state house yesterday. And I'll start by saying this, Carol Campbell, the father of restructuring in our state, is smiling down on South Carolina this evening. They said that good things come to those who wait. And while patience has not always been my strong suit, the passage of the Department of Administration, the biggest and most important piece of government reform South Carolina has seen in two decades was well worth the wait. That we are able to celebrate this win is the product of a lot of work by a lot of people. But there are a few who have been down in the trenches fighting to make this a reality. And I'm gonna take a moment to single them out. Representative Gary Smith, Representative Jay Lucas, Representative Greg Delaney, former Representative Jim Harrison, Senator Vincent Shaheen, Senator Thomas Alexander, Senator Larry Martin, and Senator Shane Massey. Thank you. South Carolina is better because of your efforts. There is not time tonight for me to go into all the good that will come from this change, but I will say this. 
The Budget and Control Board, what I call the big green ugly monster, is dead. And with it, the legacy of a backwards administrative government that was as wasteful as it was clumsy, as inefficient as it was embarrassing. We are a better state today. We will be a better state tomorrow. And yesterday truly was a great day in South Carolina. Tonight marks the fourth time I have stood in this chamber and described to you and our fellow South Carolinians where I believe our state stands, and more importantly, where I believe she will go. Time flies, but during that time, much has been accomplished, and South Carolina is in a far different place than we were in January of 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to report that the state of our state is strong, and we're just getting started. It's important that we take a look at why our state is on the move, because our successes have so much to teach us. The Bible tells us that, quote, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. President Lincoln famously applied that truth to our nation. I believe it applies to South Carolina. There is no state in this country, no place in the world, that has more potential than we do. For too long, we weren't realizing it. For too long, we were held back by our differences, whether they were political or regional or personal. For too long, we failed to understand that we're a team and that the success or failure of our state is determined by our ability to work together. And work together, we have. Governor Campbell, whose portrait now hangs in the library of the residents, believed that if you give a person a job, you take care of a family. Three years ago, we had a lot of families to take care of. Team South Carolina was formed, and we have never looked back. The changes in South Carolina over the last few years are not the result of one person or one city or one region. We have realized that what is good for Charleston is good for Greenville. What is good for Orangeburg is good for Aiken. Even what is good for Clemson is good for Carolina. We have really realized that if we are gonna truly lift up South Carolina, we have to lift up all of South Carolina. And what a difference it has made. We have announced 43,000 new jobs in 45 out of our 46 counties. We have seen almost 10 billion invested in South Carolina. We have seen 186 expansions of existing companies, the ultimate compliment a business can give a state. We have seen the revival of our manufacturing industry with the announcement of 26,000 new manufacturing jobs. We've seen the unemployment rate of our National Guardsmen drop 12 full percentage points from 16 down to four. We have seen companies from 25 foreign countries decide that they want to do business on American soil right here in South Carolina. We've seen the time it takes for an unemployed South Carolinian to find a job decrease by a full month. We have seen the lowest unemployment rate in five years and seen our rate fall two thirds faster than the national rate. We are being referred to, which I love, as the beast of the Southeast. We now have the fastest growing economy on the East Coast, and 70,000 more South Carolinians are working today than were just three years ago. That is progress. That is real. That is the state I am so proud of each and every day. And that is proof that when we come together, there is nothing we can't accomplish. I've invited here tonight some special guests, new friends and old, who have this year invested their capital and their future in South Carolina and her people. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome and please stand when I call your name. Representing 200 jobs in Aiken County from Reclaim, Pete Davis. Representing 200 jobs in Dillon County from Harbor Freight Tools USA, Greg Elmore. Representing 145 jobs in Horry County from PTR Industries, Josh Fiorini. Representing 500 jobs in Fairfield County from Element Electronics, Mike O'Shaughnessy. Representing 318 jobs in Chester County from JN Fibers, Mark Bachner. Representing 134 jobs in Richland County from Dayton Rogers Manufacturing, Ron Lowry. Representing 149 jobs in Greenville County from Kimura, 
Shoji Kamura, representing 1,200 jobs in Berkeley County. From Benefit Focus, Sean Jenkins, representing 501 jobs in Lancaster County. From Cure America Corporation, Wally Wong. Please stand again and thank you for making our home your home. Today, the entire country is looking at South Carolina and all she has to offer. But we ta can't take our success for granted. As President Kennedy said, quote, time and the world do not stand still. Change is the law of life. And those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Our future is bright, but we have to stay one step ahead in order to compete. And competing globally means always strengthening our business climate, continuing to prepare our workforce, and fighting back the federal government when they push to treat every state the same. Every year standing here, I've asked you to join me in decreasing the tax burden we place on the families and the businesses of South Carolina. This budget year is the third year in a row that we've cut taxes for our small businesses. That's a huge thing and sends a message to companies both within and outside of our borders that we value them, their contributions to our state, and that in South Carolina, they will always be taken care of. But we have to do so much more. Just look around us. Last year, North Carolina passed one of the largest income tax cuts in their state's history. Tennessee, our constant competitor for new companies, investment, and new jobs, has no income tax. Likewise, Florida and Texas. Our tax code needs to be simpler, flatter, and fairer. And a year should not pass where we fail to move further down that road. In this year's budget, I have renewed my call for the citizens of our state to receive a tax cut of their own, this time eliminating the 6% individual income tax bracket. This simple change will put money back into the pockets of South Carolina's working families. And I ask that you join me in giving our taxpayers some additional relief. Infrastructure must also remain a priority. We are blessed to have in the Port of Charleston an asset that is the envy of our friends and competitors in states across the nation. Year after year, we are breaking export record after export record. But our port is only as good as our manufacturer's ability to get their product to it quickly, safely, and cheaply. Last year, using revenue we already had, we were able to pass into law the largest investment in South Carolina's roads and bridges in more than two decades, a billion dollars. And we did it without raising taxes. South Carolinians are about to see orange cones popping up all across our state. It's a beautiful thing. And I wanna thank Chairman Brian White and Senator Harvey Peeler for helping make that happen. But we know there's more work to be done. You might ask the question, how do we pay for it? And my answer will be, not by hiking taxes. We proved last year that we can invest in our roads and bridges with the dollars we already have. Raising the gas tax, forcing our people and our businesses to pay for more for the simple act of getting around is not an option for me. I will veto any bill that reaches my desk that raises taxes on gasoline. Unlike during the recession, thank you. Unlike during the recession, this is a good budget year with enough revenue coming into Columbia that will allow us to make smart new investments in education, roads, and public safety. That didn't just happen by magic, and it didn't happen because we raised taxes or put more burdens on businesses and families. We have a steady and strong flow of revenue into Columbia because we have the fastest growing economy on the East Coast, and unemployment is down to its lowest level in five years. If we start raising taxes, rolling over for federal mandates, and crippling our businesses, we will damage our growing economy, and we will bring in less revenue, not more. Most importantly, we will stop the amazing progress we're making in putting our people back to work. 
So instead, this year, as last, our budget writers should take the additional revenue that inevitably appears after our budget is balanced, what I call the money tree, and invest it in our infrastructure. Since 2005, the money tree that falls every year has averaged more than $106 million. According to the Department of Transportation, those dollars invested in the right way will be worth more than $1.3 billion in additional road and bridge improvements. That is prioritizing. That is our job. It will come as no surprise to anyone who has heard me speak or has watched this administration that it is my firm belief that the federal government causes far more harm to South Carolina than good. Those running the federal government make our job more difficult, day in and day out. Unfortunately, that is simply the reality we are faced with. What is not a reality in South Carolina, however, is the idea that we simply have to take every problem the feds send our way. We don't, and we haven't. Those of us who fought the president's disastrous health care plan have watched as predictions of lost coverage, rising costs, and unprecedented dysfunction have come true. Obamacare is damaging to the country, and it is damaging to South Carolina. Premiums will skyrocket. All our citizens who like their plans will not, in fact, be able to keep them. Quality of care will suffer, and so too will patients. But as a state and as an elected government, we will not be victims in this process. We rejected the federal government's less than generous offer to run a state exchange, an offer that would have Washington bureaucrats dictating the exchange and South Carolinians paying for it. And with your help, we emphatically said no to the central component of Obamacare, the expansion of a broken Medicaid program that is already cannibalizing our budget and would completely destroy it in the years to come. These were not decisions made lightly, without thought or analysis, but I am fully convinced that South Carolina will be better for them. And I pledge to you this, we will continue to fight Obamacare every step of the way. While we oppose Obamacare, we have an obligation when the federal government stands in our way to get creative and figure out how to better serve our citizens. We've certainly done that in health care, working within the system to increase transparency and drive costs out of Medicaid. And this year, we are proposing a new way to cut the waiting lists for the neediest among us, providing 1,400 disabled South Carolinians with the care they've been deprived of far too long. But there is no greater example of South Carolina getting resourceful and innovative with a federal program than the way we have tackled welfare. One of my focuses since the day I took the oath of office has been to change the perception of South Carolina. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to be proud of. I want every citizen in and out of our state to feel the same way about South Carolina that I do. Traveling the state, I often heard the complaint that there were too many dependent on government assistance. There was a belief that some of our fellow South Carolinians were choosing to remain on welfare rather than get a job. I don't believe that. We are a proud, resilient people, South Carolinians. Given the opportunity, we want to make a better life for ourselves and our families. But with the old welfare system, that opportunity didn't always exist. Under the leadership of Director Lillian Collar, a dedicated and innovative public servant, who was once named the nation's public official of the year, we've changed that. Previously, with Washington having its way, we would handle welfare, welfare recipients by asking a few simple questions, effectively checking a box and handing over a check. Easy in, easy out. But no one improves their lot in life that way. Now we do things differently. Instead of just asking routine questions designed to do little more than meet numbers and process people, we dig deeper. We ask them about their skills, what they're good at. We ask them what they like, what they want to do. And then together with our ever willing business community, we find them a job. Yes, it seems like a simple concept, but here's the deal. It works. Since starting this program in 2011, we have moved more than 20,000 South Carolinians from welfare to work.
We should all be proud of this program. But more than that, we should be proud of those workers, those South Carolinians who traded the false stability of a welfare check for the true dignity of a well-earned paycheck. We should all remember what this success story proves, that those out there struggling day to day, they don't want to spend their lives on the couch. They want a chance for more, to make their children proud. <coughs> It is our responsibility to give them that chance, and I couldn't be more proud of the fact that here and now, it's a responsibility we will continue to fulfill. There is more to changing the perception of South Carolina than putting people back to work, much more. And it starts with all of us in the chamber here tonight. The 20th century Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis once remarked, quote, the most important political office is that of the private citizen. I believe that with everything I have. But sometimes those of us in public office forget those words. When that happens, the consequences for us, for our shared constituents, for our system of representative democracy are all devastating. When we lose the public trust, when we lose their confidence, we lose the ability to govern. Last year in this very speech, I took great pains to outline why we are dangerously close to losing the trust of the South Carolina public. I listed the shameful way the ethics laws and standards for South Carolina elected officials were ranked by independent watchdogs. I thought about doing so again tonight, but then I realized there was no need. There was no need because we already know. We know that the ethics laws that we have are not good enough. We know that the public deserves better than the government we are giving them. We know that South Carolina needs stronger and clearer ethics laws, and we know we need it this year. We know that we are one of just four states that don't require income disclosures, and we know we can't wait until we are the very last to fix the problem. We know that South Carolinians want an investigative process they can believe in, and we know that means a truly independent process. No more House members investigating House members. No more senators investigating senators. Most of all, we know we have to do better. Public officials should not fear more transparency. We should not fear fair and independent investigations. We should embrace them because we should have nothing to hide from the people we serve. The good news is in one year, we have made real progress. The House has passed the strongest ethics reform bill in a generation. The Senate, in large part thanks to the perseverance of Chairman Larry Martin, moved that bill quickly through the committee process. I would be remiss if I didn't again thank Attorneys General Henry McMaster and Travis Medlock for the remarkable reform package they put together. And if I did, if I did not give special recognition to Senator Chip Campson, Senator Wes Hayes, and Representative Rick Quinn for their leadership in helping to push this legislation forward. But we're not done yet. As the Senate is poised this month for debate, I ask you not to water down this historic reform. I ask, you, I ask that you not make excuses, and I ask each and every one of you, Republican and Democrat, Senator and House member, to send me a strong ethics reform bill this year and show the people of this state that we as their elected representatives deserve their trust. Just two days ago, our nation celebrated the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It goes without saying that he wrote and said much of great consequence in a life cut altogether too short. But one particular sentiment struck me. Dr. King said, quote, there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him it is right. That call to conscience could apply to the ethics laws I just spoke about and the need to restore the public's faith in our government. But to me, it had a different meaning. It struck a different chord. What weighs on me is the education of South Carolina's children. The time has come for us to do what is right. Many of you may know my story by now of my educational experience. It's something I've been talking about for years, but I think it bears repeating here. I was, born and I was born and raised in Bamberg and went to school in a brick box. We didn't know what we didn't have, but we always took care of each other. 
Now my daughter Rena attends the brand new River Bluff High School in Lexington, where every classroom has a 72-inch television and every child has an iPad. I wish I could say that was generational progress, but the thing is, it's progress based on geography, not on generational advancement. Because when I went back to Bamberg to give an anti-bullying speech, the school didn't even have the equipment to show a video. That's wrong, it's immoral, and it has to change. I still remember what it was like as a young girl in Bamberg. I remember the feeling of seeing other schools that were bigger and nicer than ours and wondering what that must be like. Our kids should never feel that they are more or less worthy based on where they live. Our children should all feel like they have every opportunity to be as successful as they dream to be. And South Carolina can no longer accept the quality of our children's education being determined by where they are born and raised. In truth, I came to you last year knowing much of this. My childhood experiences certainly haven't changed in the last 12 months, and Rena was getting a wonderful education long before she moved into River Bluff. What I didn't know was exactly how to change it, so I asked for help. And as I have found to be the case time and again, the people of South Carolina delivered just what was needed. The education conversation we started one year ago was one of the most interesting and enlightening experiences I've had as governor. I want to acknowledge the legislators who participated in this process with me. Senator John Corson, Senator Wes Hayes, Senator John Matthews, Senator Nikki Setzler, Representative Kenny Bingham, Representative Jackie Hayes, and Representative Phil Owens. You came into this with an open mind and a willingness to work and to listen, and for that, I thank you. We met with teachers, we met with parents, we met with former state superintendents, Republican and Democrat. We met with administrators and principals, business leaders and deans. We learned a lot and we formed a plan. A plan centered on the idea that in South Carolina, we need to take targeted approaches to education in a way that drives results for our kids. We looked at the way we funded education at the state level. We found our formula to be outdated misguided, and that as a result, we are not doing the best job of directing dollars to areas that need them most. Today, our primary funding formula doesn't account for children who are gifted or those who require individual instruction. We don't account for children who have difficulty speaking English. We don't account for those adult students ages 17 to 21 who are still pursuing a diploma or a GED. But the most glaring failure on our part has been the failure to acknowledge that it simply costs more to educate a child in poverty. Research shows that the cost of teaching low-income students with proven methods is roughly $1,200 more per child. As a state, we can't afford to ignore that any longer. Under our proposed changes, school districts will receive 20% more in state dollars for each child that falls into the poverty index. In real terms, the simple change means that next year, almost 100 million more will flow to South Carolina's neediest children. We cannot spend an unlimited amount on our schools, and money for sure is far from the only answer to our problems in education. What we can do is be smarter about how we spend what we spend. We can make sure it is going where it is most needed, where it will make the most difference. That starts this year. We have fallen into the bad habit in South Carolina of promoting students through grade levels before they are ready. Teachers don't want to do this. They feel pressure from administrators and districts and school boards to keep children moving and to keep numbers up. And they feel pressure from everywhere not to damage a child socially by keeping them back. To that, I would simply say that a child who cannot read at the level of his or her peers is already damaged socially because a child who cannot read is a child who cannot learn. Studies show that children who cannot read proficiently by the end of the third grade are four times more likely not to graduate high school on time. 
And South Carolina ranks 42nd in the country when it comes to our fourth graders' ability to read at a basic level. Those two statistics together paint a dangerous picture for South Carolina's future. But we can turn the tide. Led by Governor Jeb Bush, Florida undertook one of the most meaningful transformations in education this country has ever seen. And when I asked Jeb, he told me the most important thing they did was teach those kids to read. We're going to follow that model. Every elementary school in South Carolina will be offered a reading coach to make sure that no child leaves the third grade unable to read. <clears throat> And we're going to increase our investment in summer reading camps to make sure that students don't regress from year to year and that in places like Allendale or Dillon that may have fewer opportunities outside the school year, our kids have a safe and productive way to spend their summers. It has been said that, quote, to learn to read is to light a fire. We can light that fire in the mind of every child in South Carolina, change the fortunes of generations of children yet to come and forever alter the direction of our state. Earlier, I spoke briefly about my trip to Bamberg and the gap that exists in technology between our schools that have and those that have not. Technology is the future, not just in education, but in all aspects of our lives. We cannot pretend that we are preparing South Carolina's children for the world that awaits if some of them remain unaware of what that world looks like, especially when that lack of awareness is not their choice, but is imposed upon them by circumstance, or worse, by our indifference. South Carolina is going to invest in education technology in a way that we never have before. We are going to make sure that the internet gets to our schools. We're going to make sure that those schools are wired to receive it. We're going to provide the tools, computers, tablets, and instructional materials so that our teachers can get the most out of our investment and out of our students. And South Carolina schools are going to be equipped to compete with any school in any state. The most impactful meeting I had over the last year was with about a group of 50 teachers from across the state. They were in a difficult place. They know the problems with our schools. They see them firsthand every single day. What they so desperately want is for us to help them help our kids. In many ways, past debates over education have damaged their confidence. When we are not careful about how we talk about very real education needs, we can beat down the teachers who are the special link between a child and his or her education. That has to stop. We have to support our teachers with the right training and with the right attitude about what our schools are achieving and what they can achieve in the future. These are big changes we're calling for, I know. I also know that big changes are not always easy. But the size of these changes pales when compared to the size of their importance. We can make them. We can transform education in South Carolina. And we can do it without raising a single tax without taking a single existing dollar away from a single district. And when those changes seem too big or too hard, remember at the core, this is just a simple question. Are we willing to stand two children side by side and tell one that through no fault of his own, he is going to attend a school with less while at the same time telling the other she will have every ounce of support she needs to thrive. I can tell you I am not, and I hope you will join me. I started tonight proclaiming the state of our state to be strong. I believe the path I've outlined here tonight will make South Carolina even stronger. It's a path that creates jobs at a much faster rate than the rest of the country. A path that moves more people from welfare to work. A path that cleans up our ethics laws. And a path that gives every child, no matter the circumstances of their birth, a chance at success. Last year, the world lost an iconic woman, and I a personal hero. 
Margaret Thatcher was a towering figure of history, a force for what was right and what was good. She will be missed, but her words will remain with us. Quote, look at a day when you are supremely satisfied at the end. It's not a day when you lounge around doing nothing. It's when you've had everything to do and you've done it. South Carolina is in a far better place than just a few short years ago, but we still, in Lady Thatcher's words, have everything to do. We can keep South Carolina surging forward. We can create new opportunities and tackle our challenges. We can continue to make South Carolina the best place in America to live, work, and raise a family. But I can't do it alone. I ask each one of you in this chamber to lend your support and your energies to securing the future of the state we all so dearly love. It's a future that is just so bright. Thank you, God bless you, and may he continue to bless the great state of South Carolina. just completed her 2014 State of State Address and uh, is acknowledging all the members of the House and Senate and all of the judiciary and others who are in attendance, those in the galley area, the guests that she invited this evening to recognize the job creation throughout South Carolina. It was a relatively short speech, but she hit on all the primary topics of her legislative agenda for 2014. The members of the Joint Assembly will remain uh, on their feet as the governor and her distinguished party leave the chamber. End of the joint session as the governor is getting ready to exit. Acknowledging all those special guests. Her escort party. and acknowledging members of the House and Senate as she exits the House chamber. She ended her speech with an emphasis on education reform and certainly laid out an aggressive agenda for 2014. Governor Haley's speech for the State of State Address for 2014 is concluded. And earlier in, the, earlier in the day, Representative James Smith of Richland County recorded this Democratic message. Good evening, fellow South Carolinians. My name is James Smith, and I'm grateful to serve the people of South Carolina in the State House of Representatives. I've been given the privilege of providing the Democratic response to Governor Haley's State of the State Address. As Democrats, the minority party, we are the watchdogs of the governor and the Republican majority. We share a deep and abiding love for our state and have a duty to the people of South Carolina to speak out. But first, and I know I speak on behalf of a grateful state and nation when I say, welcome home to Captain Michael Haley from his tour of duty in Afghanistan. And thank him and the 18,000 of my fellow South Carolina guardsmen and their families for their service and sacrifice for our nation. As long as this country intends to remain the land of the free, it must always be the home of the brave. And our home, the great state of South Carolina, and its people deserve the very best in leadership. Leadership is vision first, for where there is no vision, the people will perish. Leadership is then collaboration and action Leadership accepts responsibility and requires accountability. And the people of South Carolina deserve leadership. Leadership that makes public education job one, day one, and not wait four years until election time to make our children's future a priority. South Carolina, and specifically the town of 96, deserves leadership that does not wait months to take action to protect our children and families in a tuberculosis outbreak. South Carolina deserves leadership that does not expose our private financial information to hackers and criminals and then cost tens of millions in our taxpayer dollars to protect what could have been protected for free. 
South Carolina deserves leadership that protects our most vulnerable in the care of the Department of Social Services. And South Carolina deserves leadership that doesn't sell out the engine of our economy, the Port of Charleston, for 30 pieces of silver at a campaign fundraiser in Georgia. Governor, you cannot order your administration to say it's a great day in South Carolina and make it so. It takes leadership, real leadership, that keeps faith and trust with the people of South Carolina and accepts responsibility for the office you hold. You must know and share in the challenges we face together as South Carolinians. To do that, you have to be here, here present in South Carolina. You must care more about doing your job as governor than keeping your job as governor. We deserve better than this. We, the people of South Carolina, urban, rural, low country, Midlands and upstate, seek a South Carolina where our values are upheld our resources are preserved, and our human capital enriched. We expect our leaders, Republicans and Democrats, to be more concerned about our next generation than their next election. We expect our leaders to work together for us all, regardless of party, ideology, race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion. For the road to a peaceful and prosperous South Carolina must be paved and expanded with a real commitment to fix our crumbling roads and bridges. We can and must preserve for generations our natural heritage because the health of our environment is necessarily tied to the health of our economy. We can and we must bring our tax dollars home to work for us by reforming and expanding Medicaid and bring 44,000 real jobs to South Carolina, making health care more affordable and accessible for small and big businesses alike. We, my fellow South Carolinians, can and must have a public education system that is more than minimally adequate. Indeed, we have before and we should again move to lower class sizes, increase teacher pay to the national average. We can make higher education affordable and leverage our research universities and technical schools to fuel our continued economic growth. We can and must reform and reauthorize South Carolina First Steps to School Readiness and continue to expand four-year-old educational opportunities to ensure that every child is healthy and ready to learn by first grade. We can and should be the center of gravity for renewable energy development and lead the region and country in solar power production. And we understand that a vibrant creative arts community enriches our quality of life attracting economic growth. South Carolina's best days are ahead of her, but only if we are willing to work together and put aside our short-term and short-sighted political differences and always remember who we serve, the people of South Carolina, and serve them before we serve ourselves. With that focus, working with private industry, small and large, nonprofits, educators at all levels, we can fulfill this promise. And then we can all say, it is a great day in South Carolina. Thank you, and may God bless the great state of South Carolina. I'm here with Senator Harvey Piller from the Upstate. Senator Piller, what's your reaction to the governor's fourth state of state address? Well, it is her fourth, and I'm just so proud to call Nikki Haley our governor. I'm so proud of her. She did such a good job tonight. And it is hard to believe that this is her fourth state of the state, yet she still has that new car smell. And uh, I, I, I think she did a terrific job tonight. She touched on all the major issues. I think our session will be all about jobs, economic development, education, uh, and infrastructure. And so she touched on those issues. That's, that's the major issues of, the, of, the, of this coming session. Now, education reform, she, met, she ended her speech with that, and you're a big part of reform. You have a Read and Succeed bill that you put forth. I, I'm so glad she touched on that, the third grade reading initiative. We, we have a bill on the Senate calendar now, and her uh, proposed executive budget, she put in, I think, about $40 million towards that effort. So I appreciate it. But she, she put the education uh, debate on the front burner, and I appreciate her doing that. And what do you ultimately hope to accomplish coming out of this session as it relates to education? 
Oh, well, that and then uh, along with that is our uh, 4K initiative. I think they will uh, go hand in hand. And uh, so Lead to Succeed 4K initiative, uh, uh, giving teachers uh, teacher salaries, uh, some the attention that they need. So I, I think, like I said, education, infrastructure, that'll be the two main issues of the, of the year. And, and quite frankly, uh, the governor's wish list, uh, it'll be my job to take the governor's wish list and turn it into the Senate to-do list. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank Bill. you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Senator hey, Rankin, Ron, how are good you, to sir? see you. Thank you very much for coming yes, out. Sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. See you on the fundraising efforts. <laughs> yes, that's usually where I am. Very good. Press me in the service this evening. Thank very you for good. being with us. What were your thoughts on the governor's speech this evening, her fourth address? Certainly uh, highlighted some of the good things that we've got going on, certainly economic development in my area particularly. He, she highlighted uh, one of the groups that have come down to, to Horry County and decided to, to set up shop down there, so we're excited about the, the economic development and the job growth we've got. Challenges certainly she's uh, identified uh, how to pay for infrastructure. Uh, certainly she identified a, a, a money tree uh, effectively without identifying growth in uh, how to pay for uh, highways in South Carolina. We've, we've taken growth, but there's a $27 billion price tag uh, that we cannot rely on growth in a good year to catch us up with North Carolina and Georgia. So uh, the challenge on how to pay for roads, wishing that they were built on growth is probably not a realistic uh, hope here. Uh, income tax reform, uh, great idea. Certainly we want to be competitive with our sister states, uh, but the question is what does that do to the AAA bond rating that we enjoy now? Uh, challenges and, and goals that we've got to address. I uh, want to highlight some of the positive things as well. Ethics reform, we're, we're in the midst of that and I think that we will address that and uh, instill hope and uh, tr better trust given the past that we've, we've gone through. So I give her a, an A plus in identifying hope and reality, uh, but there's some real difficult challenges on meeting the realistic needs that we have. Well, we appreciate your time this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. coming yes, sir, and speaking Don, with us. Thank we you. appreciate that. Representative Bannister, yes, thank you, you very much for coming over you this bet. evening. You bet. Uh, what were your thoughts on the governor's fourth state of the state? It's hard to believe time has gone so quickly. It has gone quickly. It was a great speech, I thought. It laid out a good uh, roadmap for what she wants to do this year in the, in the legislative session. Uh, she's got a good vision for South Carolina, a lot of good reforms. It'll be. It's always helpful in the General Assembly when the governor leads and says, this is what we want to do, these are the priorities. Uh, so it, I thought it was a really good speech. From your point of view, what would be some of the significant items for you to address this legislative session? Uh, obviously, education is top of the list, infrastructure is top of the list. Uh, having her call on some specific reforms in education always helps us as we move down that path, knowing that we have her support and that she's going to be behind us saying, yes, this is what I want to do. That's, that's crucial for success in the, in the General Assembly. Um, infrastructure, when you put the parameters and you're very clear about what you will and won't do, makes it easy for us to know where we're going. So as we look for funding for infrastructure, we look for uh, solutions to our infrastructure problems, we know what we can't do and we know what we can. So those kind of leadership um, statements and putting that in the state of the state is going to be helpful this year. Well, thank you very much for coming out and we yes, appreciate you spending some time thank with you. us. Thank you. Don, how you Senator doing? Cleary, nice Thanks to have you nice. with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. What were your thoughts on the governor's now fourth address? I thought it was a great re-election campaign speech, and I like her a lot of her ideas. I'm not sure how she can accomplish them, but I think that she hit the ground on all, all of the aspects except one. Education reform is a very complicated road or path to get there. What do you think it's going to take to accomplish those sort of well, goals? We year? need to do it, but you know, one mill in Horry County creates two million dollars. One mill in Lee County is thirty-three thousand dollars. I believe in the aspect of reading coaches. I think we need to pay teachers what they they owe, they deserved. Uh, technology is the way to go, and and her talking about spending over a hundred million dollars in education, I think it's something the state needs to do. And your thoughts on the challenges with our roads and highways? Well, that's where we fall short a little bit. She talked about a billion dollar investment and we did, and we did that. But we did that mainly by borrowing. We really only put $130 million. And so if we put a billion in this year, 
and we put 100 million last year, we put 100 million, we're still 27 billion dollars short. 1,641 failing bridges, 53 percent of state secondary roads, and 48 percent of state primary roads are poor. We need to provide Edu we need to provide highway safety, we need to provide roads for infrastructure for corporations. And quite honestly, I like her idea about cutting income tax and corporate tax, but if we're taking every dime and extra money to pay for education or health care, or more importantly, do the income tax or corporate tax, there's no money left over to fix roads. And we've got to fix roads. That is one function of government. So why not increase the fees? put it in a lockbox where we can't use it for the Green Mean Museum, we can't use it for cultural centers. It goes to roads. And you know what? 34% of the people that pay for gasoline fees are from out of state. So what better way to pay? Now I know she doesn't want to vote for taxes. I want her to handle my family budget if she can complete all these things, corporate tax, income tax, roads, education, and an extra $200 million for health care, and not figure a way to pay for it. I, I don't know how we're going to do that. I want to be sensible, I don't want to waste money, but I do think we need to accept the challenge that we are going to have to create some revenue streams for DOT. Well, Senator, thank you very thank much you, for Thank you, Donna. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank, thank you very else. much. Thank you. Senator Gregory, Hello. thank you very much for coming over. Yeah, glad to. Uh, what are your thoughts overall on the broad strokes of the governor's uh, fourth state of state address? Well, I thought it was an excellent address. Uh, I think when the governor came into office, the most pressing issue for South Carolina was the need for jobs, and she has certainly succeeded in recruiting jobs, especially good manufacturing jobs. And then probably the second most pressing issue was the need to restructure South Carolina's government, which we finally accomplished uh, yesterday, first meaningful restructuring in South Carolina since Governor Campbell. So I think that uh, you know, Governor Haley has molded herself in the form of Governor Campbell and uh, been successful in recruiting jobs and also in uh, restructuring our government. For you personally, uh, what will be a significant legislative achievement beyond that this year? Well, I think the governor is you know, turning her attention now to education and uh, the task that she has put before us is a you know, very tough task and that is to bring uh, rural areas of South Carolina up to parity with the best school districts in the state. It's been a generational problem for South Carolina, but I think the governor, you know, coming from a rural district, understands uh, the need for that and hopefully you know, how to do it. Uh, I think the other pressing issue for the state right now is our roads. Um, I wouldn't agree with the governor with regard to you know, how we're going to get the money. I think that a tax increase is going to be necessary. We can't maintain the third largest uh, road system in the country with the third lowest gas tax. And it is an expensive proposition. It is. The arithmetic just doesn't work. I think the public's in favor of a small increase at the least in the gas tax in order to uh, just to alleviate the damage to cars that are being done, er, being done every day in our state due to the poor condition of our roads. So uh, hopefully we can uh, you know, come up with some formula that we can all agree on in addition to what we did last year to you know, bring our roads up to standards. Well, Senator Rankin, thank you very thank much you, for your time. You, Have a good evening. Good evening. Representative Mack, nice yeah. to see you. Thank good you for coming you. over. Um, what are your thoughts, first blush, on the governor's fourth state of state address? My thought is it was too much anti-federal government, and that is a trap that I'm hoping the state of South Carolina doesn't fall into. After all, we're part of one of the, one of the 50 states. We pledge allegiance to the flag. We're not a part of the Confederacy anymore. And the fact of the matter is, um, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, uh, we've turned down 11 billion dollars, 44,000 jobs. It, it's it's you just cannot, to me, find an explanation to uh, to um, make that work. So um, that was problematic to me, that tone of the speech. For you, what would uh, represent a, a successful legislative session in 2014? I would like to see us do some really great things with uh, public education. We need to build our, our primary grades uh, uh, primary grades up, um, working on the reading situation, as was re mentioned in the speech, which is true. Um, and I would say to the governor and a lot of Republicans, welcome to the party. That's been a Democratic issue for years. But uh, we have to do a couple things. We have to make sure that we are continuing to posture ourselves to bring great jobs here, but we have to create an education force that can that can work in those jobs. And and again, I, I go back to because it's very problematic problematic to me. 
us not taking that money because when we don't take that federal money for health care, it just goes to another state. We don't save any money uh, as far as our country is concerned, and we all pay federal taxes. So that was problematic to me. Representative, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. you have a good evening. Thank you. Representative Mack, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Kerry Smith. Kerry, oh, sorry that's about that. My apologies. That's all um, right. Your, th your first thoughts on the uh, governor's fourth state of state, what were your impressions? I, I thought she did a very good job. She hit the points she needed to. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the uh, big movers that, that I have been working on the uh, Department of Administration bill for a number of years. I was really pleased that she noted that, that we got that accomplished yesterday. Uh, she has been a tremendous help in that effort over the years. It really has. I appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to this legislative session, what do you think are going to be the topics that can move forward and actually uh, see passage at the end of the session? Well, I think, well, I'm certainly hopeful that the uh, Senate will be able to uh, get something moved forward on the ethics bill. We got it passed in the House last year. Uh, that's something that we certainly need to do. People need to be aware of where the money is coming from uh, that pays for their uh, their representatives in the uh, Senate. And I think that's a big issue. And I think I think we'll have some success there. I think you'll see some movement on some of our education issues. And I think you'll see some movement on the, uh, the road issues also. Uh, the work she's done in the uh, in the economic development has been tremendous this year, and I think we'll work also on trying to uh, give her the, uh, the the flatter, leaner tax uh, code she's looking for also. Because we've tried to do that in the past in the uh, in the House. I was part of a study committee that looked at that issue a couple of years ago with uh, my friend Tommy Stringer, who chaired that committee, and uh, we made that recommendation. I think we'll go back to it again uh, this year and uh, try and get that done for. Her. Representative Smith, thank you very much, thank and you. thank you for correcting me. Yes, I appreciate that. <laughs> Senator Martin, evening. thank you very much. Good evening to you. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on the governor now, her fourth address? Time has moved quickly uh, in her first term. It has gone by, and it's a very positive uh, speech. She uh, focused on economic development accomplishments, uh, named the number of jobs, companies from around South Carolina that's prospered, and that's helping to make South Carolina prosper, and also mentioning the education initiative that she's uh, very committed to and I think that bodes well for our future. We've got to invest in our education structure in order to move forward. I understand there were some cheers heard yesterday when the Senate vote came through on the Department of Administration. What is your feeling about that? Very relieved, very relieved. That, that's something I've lived with for either as a subcommittee chairman or a full committee chairman of the judiciary now for uh, about six years. and. Uh, took one conference bill to the floor, didn't quite get it through. This last one we did get through, and I couldn't be more pleased. And what are your thoughts on education reforms moving forward? Well, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think she's focusing on the, the right things, the poverty index. She's focusing on uh, technology. Uh, both are very key to the, to the future advancement of education in South Carolina. Senator Martin, thank you very thank much you for your time. We appreciate much. that. Hello, Senator Limehouse, nice to see you this evening. Good to meet Good you. Good evening. Well, what are your thoughts on the governor's well, uh, state of state address? Don, I was very pleased with the governor putting emphasis on stopping bullying. I have a bill, stopabully.com, and uh, hope all the listeners out there will contact their state senator and uh, house members and ask them to support Representative Limehouse 4413, stopabully.com. It's a great bill. Um, the governor spoke at length about the progress we've had with jobs, 70,000 jobs in the last three years. and. That's an accomplishment to be quite proud of. Uh, the urban areas are on fire. I would like to see us spread the jobs across South Carolina and help some of our rural areas uh, where we, we still do need some work. But yes, we are doing quite well economically in South Carolina. And that's something to be proud of, something that we should uh, be very pleased with. And uh, I think the governor spoke about income tax reduction, a 6% personal income tax. And we've done that in the House numerous times. We passed personal income tax reduction in the House over and over. So contact your state senator and uh, ask them to adopt the bill that will certainly pass. I'm sure her bill, we, we're good in the House about these pro-business initiatives. Now you mentioned rural areas and obviously education reform has a large impact on rural education. In it South does, Carolina. Don. It goes hand in hand and uh, you know if you can get your education in the, going in the rural areas then you're going to obviously have a qualified group of folks that can take these jobs. And uh, so it, it, we have work to do in South Carolina, in the rural areas, but surely uh, where I come from, the Tri-County, Charleston, with the work that we've done with Boeing, you know, I worked on uh, the uh, aeronautics hub legislation to attract Vought Alina back in 2004. Nobody knew what we were doing back then. That attracted Vought Alina. Vought Alina bought Boeing. 
Boeing is now here talking about expanding. Other companies are sure to follow. So we've got a lot of great things to be proud of in South Carolina, and, uh, and, and I think our state is uh, leading uh, the East Coast and economic development. We're right up there with Texas and South Dakota, and they've got uh, you know oil and gas. We're just doing it with jobs. Well, thank you very thank much you, for your time, Take and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Have a good evening. Right, thank, thank you very you. much. Good evening, Senator sir. Paul Campbell, nice yes, to have sir. you here this evening. Oh, it's terrific to be here. It really is. I, I thought the governor did a terrific job in there this, this evening. And she talked about the real critical issues I think the state's facing. She talked about jobs. And, you know, jobs, there's only one social program in the whole world worth two cents, and it's a job. If a family gets a job, then you can educate the family, and you can change that family for generations to come. She talked about education. Well, you're not going to have jobs unless you've got an educated workforce. And we've got to continue to power work, work workforce. We've got to support K-12 education. We've got to fundamentally change the way we educate our kids. We've got to make them better at what they do. And we've got to make sure that our schools are properly equipped so that we can do that education process. She talked about infrastructure. You can't have economic development and jobs without infrastructure. We've got to build our roads and our bridges. North Carolina has 330 uh, load deficient bridges. In South Carolina, we've got 1,300. We've got to do something about our roads and bridges that are literally falling down around us. We've got to continue to put resources in those, and we've got to be able to get our products in, our products out, our, our people to work and from work, and to shopping and from shopping. We've got to continue to work on those type of things. For you, what would mark a successful 2014 session? Oh, the market, well, we've already done some really good things. We, we passed 308, which was a restaurant carry bill for weapons. We're trying to protect the Second Amendment. Today we finished, or yesterday we finished the Department of Administration. That's going to make it better. we still got some real issues to address. But I want to address all the economic development thing that we can. I want to help create jobs. I want to get that unemployment back down into the 5% range. I want to put our people back to work again. I want to watch the state grow. I want to watch families get better. I want to watch families flourish. And to do that, I want to make sure that our education system is in really good shape. Senator Campbell, thank you so much much for your time. Thank appreciate you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Massey, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see Thank you. you very much. What yeah. were your thoughts, your first general impressions on the governor's fourth state of state address? Yeah, I thought it was positive and, and practical. I mean, she, uh, she, she celebrated some of the successes that we've had in the state over the last year, and I think that's important. I think we need to be reminded of the good things that happened. But then she also acknowledged some of the major challenges that we had and then tried to set out her vision for how to address those things. So I thought she was positive with the speech, and I thought she was also practical in recognizing some of the challenges that we had. Speaking of those challenges, two of the large ones, roads and then also education reform. Sure. How do we get there? <laughs> that those are those are, those are big challenges. Those are challenges that have been around for a while, and quite frankly, they're worse now because we kicked them down the down the road for a while. Uh, but, but infrastructure was a big deal last year, and I think it's going to be even more of a discussion this year. And it should be, it should be. So what we've got to try to do is to figure out how to how to get the money that we need in order to in order to fund those road road bridge repairs, to keep up the maintenance. And it sounds like the governor was kind of boxed into a corner with some of the pressure she got because she came out pretty emphatic and said that we're not going to have a gas tax. So that, that certainly is going to is going to impact how we're going to try to find that revenue. Well, we wish you luck with that, Senator. Thanks and thank a lot. you for your right, time. Have a good night. Okay. Representative Nine. Taylor, yes, good to sir. see you. Nice, nice to pleasure to, see to meet you, you sir. As well. thank, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. So, on first blush, what are your thoughts on the governor's fourth state of the state address? Well, I was impressed in particular by her, uh, of course, touting the economic development that's occurred here in the last several years. It's been marvelous, you know, and we are the beast that roars here in South Carolina. Also, her education agenda, she's on the money. It's just a beginning, and yes, it, it does involve some money. But as vice chair of the House Education Committee, we, that's a good start. We've got to do better than we're doing. But I was particularly struck by one line in her address, and she said the federal government does far more harm to South Carolina than good. That couldn't be more true at every level. This is why I've sponsored and the prime sponsor of the Article 5 Convention of States legislation, the application that we would call for a Convention of States to propose amendments to the Constitution. We now have some 14 or 15 sponsors of the House bill. We're moving forward with this. But she's right. We have to take an out-of-control federal government and put a cap on it. And we, the states, have that sovereign authority to do that. We can actually have a convention of states and do what Congress should do to themselves, which is put limits on themselves. They don't do that. They will never do that. That's our job. So remember. The federal government does more harm to South Carolina than good, and the money they give us 
they're just printing it. So they're broke, sending us money that they don't have. We need to fix them, get a balanced budget amendment, term limits for Congress. We need to fix them. So I'm with the governor on this one completely. Representative Taylor, thank, thank you so you much for your much. time. You bet. Representative Benefield, nice to see you this evening. Thank you, you so much for your time. Glad to be here. What are your thoughts on the governor's state of state address in 2014? I think she did uh, She did a good job. I'm most impressed with the job numbers. I appreciate her ability to surround herself with people who are great at industrial recruitment and job growth in our state. It's very positive to think about 43,000 additional jobs from this time a year ago. Um, folks moving from welfare to work, very positive, looking for many more good things. Moving forward through the session, do you see any landmines or, or, or traps out there moving forward with the legislative agenda she laid out in her speech? Uh, not, not totally. Um, I, I think there'll be lots of discussion about her, her educational changes and additional spending. I think that's going to re require a, a lot of prioritization on our part, finding uh, where we need to lean down in order to make certain changes, but overall, good job. Thank you very much Thank for your time. time. Okay, yes, sir. appreciate it. Hey. Peter. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Come on hey, out. I'm Peter Represent McCoy, how are you? Representative McCoy, Good nice to, to have you, you out here. Thank you uh, for So me. what were your thoughts this evening on the uh, governor's fourth state of state address? I thought the governor gave a very positive speech, which is very good for the South Carolinian people to hear right now, with particular emphasis, I would say, on unemployment and, and, what, and the staggering figures we've had that we've made in helping folks get jobs, helping folks get employed, and basically making South Carolina a good place to raise our children and our families here. And i got to say, too, um, a big issue down where I'm from in Charleston is infrastructure. And she addressed some major concerns there with roads and bridges, and especially put a lot of emphasis on our Charleston port, which we're very proud of. Now, do you think you can find it uh, a successful co conclusion to addressing the roads and the educational reform issues that are, are going to be coming forth through the session? Absolutely. I think we're going to make a lot of headway in terms of putting a lot of money towards infrastructure and roads and bridges. And with our Charleston port and putting the money that we need to, to deepen that harbor is going to be such a huge economic impact on our state. One in six jobs are linked to our port. So it's very important that we, 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 we do the proper precautions and do the proper measures to, to, to deepen our port. Thank you very Thank much you. for your time, Representative. I appreciate, appreciate it. The pleasure Absolutely. to meet you. Absolutely. Very good to meet you. Representative Jefferson. Yes, sir. How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are Good. you this evening? I am doing fine, thanks. Uh, what were your thoughts on the governor's uh, fourth state of state address? Well, I, th I was a little disappointed. I really was. Number one, she talked about federal monies not being uh, spent wisely and really not even needed in the state of South Carolina. And that's not so. You know, our budget was basically $6.8 billion here in South Carolina, but the total budget was $22.3 billion, which means that at least $16 billion of that money came from the federal government. So we can't just turn our backs on federal money. I mean, you talk about the affordable health care. That program is helping a lot of people. More specifically, when you talk about the affordable health care, those programs are designed for people who are working people, but they work part-time. People who work at Walmart, and that's not to say that uh, everybody's part-time at Walmart, but those who work at Walmart, um, Kentucky Fried, Burger King, places like that, those people are being affected in a positive way as a result of the affordable health care. Why do I know that? Because I've been to at least 10 of the town hall meetings and I've seen people signing up. So it's working. I also um, would like to see more roads being redone. We still have too many potholes and too many of the rural areas. There has to be an equalization of funding being spent not only in education, but also in our infrastructure. So as long as we can continue to work together, I enjoyed that portion of what you said. But let's do that. Let's just not talk about it. Let's work together. Representative, thank you so much for your time. Thank have you. a great evening. Thank you so much. Hi. Representative Brown. How are you? Pleasure to meet you, sir. Good. Pleasure to so, meet you. So what are your thoughts on the governor's uh, fourth uh, state of state address? Governor's speech was similar as last year, but uh, I like to applaud her this year for joining the Democrats and providing better ed education for all of our children. You know, these improvements been, have been needed for years. And so this time she's joining with us, who've been fighting for years and years for improving in education for all of our children, especially the one in public school. Uh, but I disagree with the governor when she said she does not want to see a gas tax increase. I want to see the gas tax increase because our roads and bridges are crumbling and they're not being maintained. And we really, really do need those roads fixed and maintained. 
What will mark a successful session for you this year? Well, for we to get all these things passed and for the governor to get support from the legislature on, on some of her projects that, that she had out, outlined and uh, get our road and bridges fixed. Representative, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Senator Hembry. John, good pleasure to, see to you. meet you, sir. It's my pleasure. So, what were your thoughts on the governor's uh, state of state address for 2014? Well, I, I thought it was uh, to the point. It had, uh, you know, kind of focused on the I think the main issues that we're all dealing with: transportation, education, uh, ethics. So, uh, particularly appreciated the the reference to the ethics bill. It's in the Senate right now, so we're we're diligently working on it. But it's going to be a struggle, and it's going to be a tough, you know, tough fight. There's not unanimity in what we need to do, and we're uh, hopeful that that encouragement from the governor will uh, will help us pass. The, the ethics reform that we need. I was going to say those that agenda she laid out. That's heavy lifting. Those those are not easy issues to accomplish. So what are your what are your hopes and, and what do you like to see at the end of the session? Well, uh, if we can make some strides toward education, I think that uh, that uh, reading program is is a, a key component. I think that's good policy, and we need to go forward with that. We've got to find more money for transportation. However, you know, however we do that, um, I mean, that's just something that's going to chronic. That's going to be a chronic issue that we're going to deal with every year. But the ethics bill is the thing we need to deal with most critically now. So that's uh, that's that's right in front of us, and that's what we need to take care of tomorrow. Senator, thank, thank you, you very Doug. much. My pleasure. For the session. How you doing? Representative Gilliard, yeah. pleasure to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. So, yes, what sir. were your thoughts on the governor's state of state address for 2014? Well, I think it was just political grandstanding. Uh, you know, even the issues that she talked about funding education, it's always been a democratic issue. But really, I, I really take note tonight on the fact that she mentioned the late Dr. Martin Luther King in her speech. And I can almost assure you that if Dr. King had lived today, he would have been out here protesting and asking her, why aren't you accepting the Medicaid expansion? Why did you turn the $350 million down toward education? Those are the things Dr. King would have been talking about. So I was very sad that she had used his name in the state of the state speech. Now she left something out, which I think is really just as important too. The state employees, not one word about giving them a raise, whether it's our state troopers, whether it's our teachers, whether it's the environmental specialists, we have to look out for our state employees. They're overdue 200 years in the making for a raise. And, and I meant to say that, not to be facetious, but it's about time we take care of our state employees because if we don't take care of them, then what right do we have to brag about the beautiful state of South Carolina? You know, uh, it's a great day in the state of South Carolina. You cannot say it's a great day in South Carolina when you have the fastest population of homeless people in the whole country. Check the stats. You know, we have to take care of those who are voiceless and those people who need help. The only way we're going to do that, we have to practice what we preach. Just don't jump on a Democratic bandwagon when it's time come for re-election. Don't do that. You, you embarrass the state and you embarrass your constituents. And I'll be the first to tell her that. Representative Gilliard, thank you so much for your thank time you. this evening. Thank, thank you. you very much. Well, this will conclude South Carolina ETV and ETV Radio's coverage of Governor Nikki Haley's 2014 State of State Address. We want to thank our viewers and listeners on ETV Radio and viewers of South Carolina ETV and those on the web for being with us this evening. We will now join our regularly scheduled programming already in progress. Good night.